Sisters, brothers, friends in Christ, a very special welcome to all of you on this lovely and wet in some places Tuesday evening. I am Keisha Melhedo Forrest of the Church of the Transfiguration, and I'll be moderating this evening's study, Miracles of Healing, but specifically healing of the invalid. Before we start, let us invite God into our midst. Our sister, Mrs. Pat Slater, will lead us in prayer. Huh? Father, Father who loves us, Father you love us intricately, Father you love us deeply, and so as we come to you this evening Lord, we just pray oh God that your Holy Spirit will overshadow us, that you will open our minds that we'll understand more of what you want to pour into us this evening. And so we bring before you, Alicia, Ms. Reed, oh God, Nicola Reed, Lord, that your God will pour into her, that she will pour into us, and that we'll understand everything that she's trying to tell us, oh God, and that we'll share openly and that we learn from each other, because that is our purpose, oh God. We thank you, Lord, for this platform that you have given us, Lord. We pray, oh Father God, that you make use of it, and that you use it to your glory. And those this evening, oh God, who don't know the purpose, oh God, that after you have poured into us, that we we'll understand our purpose while we're here. We, oh God, know that you are from everlasting to everlasting. 
There is no one like you. You are the God of yesterday and that you are the God of today. And so we just pray, oh Father God, that you will tabernacle with us this evening, that you'll strengthen our faith in you, that you'll draw us closer to you, Father God. And we just pray, oh God, that we, oh Lord, will be worthy, Lord. Will be worthy because your word said, who can ascend into the hills of the Lord? Or who can stand in his holy place? Only those with clean hands and pure hearts. One that lifted up their soul and vanity in our soul and deceitfully, they shall receive the blessing from you. And so we pray, Father, that you will be with us this evening. Continue to guard us, to guide us, and to help us to love your word because your word is truth, your word is life, your word is in light. So be with us now and forever we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you very much, Sister Pat. Appreciate that. Okay, so last week's session signaled the completion of the first sub-theme of our study, Miracles Over Nature. Recall that the overarching theme for this particular series is messages in the miracles. And the last month was spent looking at miracles over nature. And last week specifically, we had looked at walking on water. This week, we start our second sub-theme, which is Miracles of Healing. And the focus of this study is healing of the invalid, which will be led by our sister, Miss Nicola Reed, guided by John 5, 1 to 15. Then over the next four weeks, we will look at other miracles of healing, healing of the paralytic, healing of the blind man, healing of the woman with the issue of blood, and finally, healing of the crippled woman. We'll then move into our final sub-theme, special signs and wonders, starting on November 8th. And we'll share more about the topics to be covered in the weeks ahead. In, in the weeks ahead. I now invite us to listen to a meditation piece to put us in the frame of mind for study. I am the God that healeth thee. I am the Lord, your I sent my word and healed your disease. I am the Lord, your healer. I am the God that healed me. I am the Lord, your healer. I sent my word and heal your disease. I am the Lord, your healer. God's name is more powerful than any disease you can name tonight. You might have received a horrible report from the doctors told you your disease is incurable but you know what there's hope tonight there is hope because God's promised that he would heal us I want you to put his word on your lips tonight sing his word back to him and see if his name isn't more powerful than cancer than heart disease or any disease that you can name tonight. Oh yes, he's your healer. Let's sing it to him. You are the God that healeth me. You are the God.
Thank you very much, Alicia, for playing that meditation piece. So it's now time for us to get into our study, and I'd like to introduce our presenter for this evening, Miss Nicola Reed. She is no stranger to many of us. She is actually a longstanding and active member of the Church of the Transfiguration, contributing in various capacities, including as a member of our audiovisual team that delivers our streamed services each week, each Sunday. She's also a member of our outreach ministry and our church committee. She's a chartered accountant by profession and is a devoted Christ follower. She has led a number of our studies, but in the pre-pandemic period, so she might be new to some of you, but she is in fact long-time family. Welcome, Sister Nicola, and thank you for joining us this evening. Now, before you get into the study, I just want to remind our participants, our students, about our housekeeping matters. So we're going to keep our mics muted and videos off unless we're contributing to the study. And we invite you to place your questions or comments in the chat or to raise your hand to be acknowledged. Um, our sessions are always interactive, so you need not wait until the end to raise your questions. Okay, over to you, Sister Nicola. Thank you, Keisha. Let me share my screen. Okay, brothers and sisters. Um, this evening, uh, we hope to go through um, the healing of the invalid in John 5, 1 to 15. So what are we going to look at this evening? Well, we're going to start off with our focus passage because that will be the frame on which we will build um, the lessons that we're going to be learning this evening. So we're going to start off with some initial questions and then we'll set the context for this particular miraculous event. We'll then ask some questions. Do you want to be made well? And who was the invalid? And then we'll look at some responses, to invalids and Jesus. Then as we wind down, we'll look at some tricky issues dealing with the Sabbath and the whole issue of sin. And then we'll summarize and close out with the lessons that we would have hopefully learned. So let us look at our focus passage. And I'd love to have a reader from our audience. You can read from your own Bible, or if you want to use the what's on the screen, that is fine. But um, could we get a reader for our focus passage? After, after this, there was a festival of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now in Jerusalem, by the Sheep Gate, there's a pool called in Hebrew Bethsaida, Bet which has five porticles. In these lay many invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. Some, some, one man was there who had been ill for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had been there a long time, he said to him, do you want to be made well? The sick man answered him, sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. And while I'm making my way, someone else stepped down ahead of me. Jesus said to him, stand up, take your mat and walk. At once the man was made well and he took up his mat and began to walk. Now that day was a Sabbath. So the Jews said to the man who had been cured, it is a Sabbath. It is not lawful for you to carry your mat. But he answered them, the man who made me well said to me, take up your mat and walk. They asked him, who is the man who said to you, take it up and walk? Now the man who had been healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had disappeared in the crowd that was there. Later, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, see, you have been made well. Do not sin anymore so that nothing worse happens to you. The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So I'm posting a few initial questions here for us to keep in mind. We can look at some answers and then we'll, at the end, come back and see if we can more fully answer some that we may have 
perhaps didn't fully answer this time around. So my first question is, why this particular miracle was included in the Gospels. In fact, there were 34, there are 34 miracles recorded across the four Gospels. And as John noted in, in John 21, 25, Jesus did a lot of, of things that were not recorded. So why do we think this particular miracle was recorded for our benefit? A any thoughts? Any ideas? If not, we, we, we can keep that question in mind as we look through this particular passage. But it's something for us to think about as to why certain miracles are recorded and others most likely have not been recorded. So something that we, we can keep in mind. Another question that we need to focus on is what are some of the main themes? Having read through the passage, can we identify any? main themes, any, anything that speaks to us in a special way uh, as a consequence of going through this particular passage. Um, we will probably address some of that if there's no um, thoughts at this particular point in time. And thirdly, did we notice anything strange in this passage as we read through it? And I'll give you a clue, there's something missing from the passage. So if we go back and look in our Bibles, we will see that the passage starts and we have verses one, two, three, and then we jump to five. In a lot of our um, newer Bibles with newer translations, the verse four is omitted. In some Bibles, it is there as a footnote, but in others, it's just omitted completely. And that particular verse, verse four, deals with the whole issue of the angel moving the waters of the pool, and that being the, the agent for healing. And so you can look back and see, maybe if you have King James, verse four is there, but the newer versions don't have a verse four. So that was something unusual. And then the final question that I'm hoping that we'll keep in mind and perhaps have some answers to by the end of this particular session is, does sin cause sickness or illnesses? And is, is it a punishment? So when we are sick, is, is it because we have some secret sin that we are not uh, acknowledging or we are ignoring? So do we agree or disagree that sin causes sicknesses and illnesses? So we'll come back to these um, questions again at the end, and hopefully um, we will have some position that we, we agree on or we, we, we um, can discuss as to the answers to these particular questions. So what is the context or our setting for our healing of the invalid. Um, being good, good Anglicans and good Christians, we would know that there are many miracles that Jesus performed. And, and some of these miracles, and Jesus and his disciples, of course, performed. And some of these miracles are unusual. Um, we call um, people being healed by Paul's shadow, P Peter's shadow, and Paul's handkerchief. Um, as as some of the unusual, Jesus using um, spit and dirt to heal. And in the Old Testament, we have examples of people being healed by um, Elijah's bones, the man dropping in the um, grave of Elijah and being healed. So there are many examples in the Bible of unusual ways in which God has healed persons. So another question that we probably can consider is, is it always a case that the unusual, the extraordinary is, is, is symptomatic or symbolic that God is at work? Is that true or is that not true? Any thoughts? So 
but something to consider. So it's, from my viewpoint, I, I don't necessarily think that in every instance that an extraordinary event is, is, is an indication that God is at work. So we have to test and, and, and review and ask for God's guidance. Um, I see a raised hand, Jean. Yes. Can go ahead, Jean. You can open up your mic. Yes. I'm remembering when um, Moses I had performed a miracle. I think it was when they, they turned the water into blood that the Egyptian magicians also did the same thing. Exactly. Right. So that is why we need discernment and the guidance of the Holy Spirit to, to help us to, to see behind the extraordinary and the miraculous sometimes. Thanks, Dean. So for our context, Jesus has been, you know, working his, you know, starting his work, his ministry, and the earlier chapters of John, we see that he has already been showing who he is and what he really has come to do. So we have the, the wedding at Cana, turning water into wine, and, and the interaction with the woman at the well. So Jesus, before coming to the pool of Bethsaida, has been actively working, revealing himself to people all over um, the, the, the little Israel there. Um, so he has been showing himself to his friends, the religious leaders and authorities who are not too happy. Um, sinful outcasts like the Samaritan woman, his relatives were also in, to some extent not so happy as well learned scholars, noble and powerful, the guests at the wedding. So he has been showing him himself to everybody, showing that he was and for us is the savior. He meets people from all walks of life. He has come for everybody, the high, the low, the rich, the poor, and the in-between. So, the pool, or as it says, in the porticos, the, those five porticos um, at the temple where the pool was located, in these lay many invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. And my question, and I have some answers there, but there, there, there's scope for other um, responses, is what strikes you about that scene at the portico of the temple. We can think of a, a, of an event in Jamaica, like when you have a you know big sports event of football where the boys are playing and the place is crowded. It would have been a similar um, scene at the temple because it was a time of festival. So it would have been crowded, packed with people. What about that particular scene speaks to us, if anything? Do we have any thoughts? Yes, Beverly, go ahead. You're, my, you're question, still muted. Yeah. my question, thank you. My question is really, I, I want to step back a little because I'm not sure I'm following sure. properly. You yes. spoke about the healing, miracles of healing. Yes. And um, you listed in that the woman at the well. Is, is that generally considered? I mean, what is our definition here of healing? No. Well, no, it was not. If I said healing, I meant more that he, he, he was starting his ministry, doing his work. Healing is a part of that ministry, but also um, spreading the word that he has come to save. That was part of his ministry as well. So I should have said ministry rather than just limiting to healing. Okay. 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 Thanks. Right. So Jesus was starting his work, okay. his ministry in the earlier chapters of, of John, and this is all a continuation of it. Does that help, Beverly? Yes, it does. Thank you. All right. Um, Noreen, I see your hand. Right. Yes, you, you asked, asked. Um, what it was that might have struck us about it, and each time <clears throat> I read or hear it read, I've always thought of the fact that 
there were so many persons and if the troubling of the water, only an individual or perhaps a very limited number that would be healed because the, the story tells us the man had been there for 38 years and one wonders, you know, um, at perhaps the, the hope that people have that year after year, even knowing that they might not be able to get into the water, just as the man said, he was not able to, and yet they came year after year, hoping that somehow they might be the one to be, to be healed. And um, the thought of hope springing eternal came to mind and also, you know, how long does one continue to Need wait to in this hope? Yes. Very good point, Serene. I see my brother, Mr. E. Yes. Sister Nicola. Yes. I, I, this passage always moves me because I vividly empathize with the almost the desolation of so many sick and invalid at this particular place. But, but what is striking is that although the needs were so great, the religious authorities um, ignore them. And I think there's a message there that as people of, of God, we must be very careful not to ignore the misery, the poverty that is around us every day. Uh, the, the other thing that struck me was that uh, of all of these persons in need, uh, only, only one was healed. And the reason for that, I suspect, must be the faith that was displayed by that one. So those are some of the things that strikes me about this particular passage. Thank you. Thank you, Jean, um, Beverly, Noreen, and my brother, Tony. Yes, you guys have stolen my thunder. Yes. Um, starting with, with Noreen's point about coming there year after year and waiting and hoping for a miracle. Um, the, the invalid himself had been there for 38 years. So they, 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 they are there waiting for the, the stirring of the water. But then Jesus came along and um, I don't think they noticed him, right? So yes, they are there waiting and hoping for their miracle. Um, but Jesus, who is the, the great uh, miracle worker, has come along and they didn't really pay him any mind. So sometimes um, we, we are waiting and hoping for our deliverance, quote unquote, our miracle, uh, but we only want it in a certain way. So the, the multitude here only expected healing to come through the, the, the agency of the angel moving the water, but Jesus is there and they, they, they haven't noticed him at all. So sometimes we have to look beyond um, where we are and, and how we expect things to happen. Yes, Jean, go ahead. What strikes me as strange is that uh, Jesus is the one that initiates here and he only initiates with one person. And, and that one person also was waiting for the movement of, of the, the water by the angel and was no doubt terribly discouraged, you know. And what it says to me, and it's, it's probably a very unpopular thought, but what it says to me is that Jesus did not heal everybody. There, there are places where it says, and he healed them all. But this is not one of those places. One of them. Right, right. It is. Carolyn? Greetings, greetings. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm the only one who thinks that they, these persons may have been there even more um, quite often as well, repeatedly, just as this man for 30 something years. 
and not one of them thought that they could assist him. The selfishness of them is quite profound here for me. You know, it's just like us here today. Every man for themselves, you know. Some no at man. no point, no one saw him, generally speaking. We'll use it loosely. <laughs> just like in the scriptures, he talks about the nations and he calls them female. So, yes. So, you know, the, the selfishness of us as a people, you know, has been from then until now. That was what struck me in this particular script. Right. Yeah, that is true. So, and the, the second point is, you know, the, the fact that, yes, um, what Jesus said, the poor you have with you um, always. You could have added the, the, the sick you have with you always as well. And, and as has been pointed out, there were these sick persons, they're right in the temple there, but the religious authorities are not paying them any mind. They are left to their own devices and, and to see how best, you know, in the competitive um, dog eat dog world, they can, you know, seek out their own salvation. So it's, 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 a, it's a message for us as well, that these are some of the things we need to consider. Our, our Christianity or our, our, our belief or faith has to be beyond ourselves, our faith community, and, and covers everybody that we come into contact with. We, we are God's representative, so we need to be showing. And where we, we, we see we can make a difference, no matter how small it is, if everybody made that one step, it will it that will become a, a snowball that um, you know can change the circumstance that particular circumstance. So very good um, group. Uh, we have identified some of the 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 things that jump out when we look at the the crowd that was at the pool at Betsa. But what about the the one person who was healed? What about the invalid? Who was he? And I, I, using this slide here to help us develop a sort of mental picture of the invalid using verses five to nine. So what do we know about this, this, this man? He had been at the, the pool, or coming to the pool for healing at for at least 38 years. And even if he was afflicted as a child, that would make him maybe 40, 50, um, and the average lifespan in, in those age, ages um, was, was about 35. So he would have been an old man. And if we consider that Jesus started his ministry around the age of 30, he would have been even older. He would have been sitting at that pool waiting for his miracle longer than Jesus had been alive. He was dependent because he could not move. For whatever reason, he, he seemed to have been paralyzed. So to, to move, oh, Keisha, I see your hand up. Yes, Nicola, I just wanted to, to, to see if my interpretation is off. While I read in the passage that, that the man had been an invalid for 38 years, I didn't, not, I didn't naturally assume that he had been going to the pool for 38 years. It is. So it, it, it's, open, it's open to um, um, interpretation. Right. I interpreted that that he had been coming to the pool for for thirty eight years. Okay. And all right. So and that is what I wanted to understand. If there was something that I had missed in the text, text that's uh, let that. me see. I, uh, I appreciate that he has been there several times. Verse six of the passage says, "Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had been there a long time." Now, the long oh. time might not be thirty eight years, but we know that he has been there a long time. Okay, my word. my version had said something slightly different. It just said that he had been in this condition for a long time. In, in, so I interpreted mm -hmm. that to mean that he had been an invalid for a long time, for consistent long time. for 38 years. But okay, so right. it, it, it depends on the version, I, the I guess. Right. Okay, all and right. It helps, it, helps, it helps to read different versions as well. You know, yes, you get different um, perspectives. Yes, Beverly, you can go Thank ahead. You. Yes, I was thinking that he probably was at the pool for quite a long time because they didn't know when the, the angel was going to come. So maybe they wanted to be there, you know, just in case. So he probably stayed at the pool almost all his life. <laughs> Not to miss his opportunity. 
Yes. Right. So he's he's dependent on somebody helping him. Yes. Uh, yes, Alicia Weller. Can go ahead. Nancy, just to say that something you said really struck me because I'd never thought of it before. I never realized the average lifespan around the time of Jesus's life was 35 years. When you said it, I actually looked it up. And it's true. it never occurred to me that when Jesus did what he did, it was at the end of his life. You know, in our time, in your 30s, is like your prime. So yes, I just, I don't know if anybody calendar. else, if that hits anybody else the way it hit me, but just to kind of highlight the fact that what Jesus did was at the end, like in those days, was at the end of his life. It's just so inspiring to me, you know? Just, just something I had to highlight because it never occurred to me that all of that was happening yeah. and what Jesus did for us was near the end. <laughs> Of, well, of his life and it shows that, that that we should always be working the work of the lord never ceases uh, whether you're very young or you're, you're middle aged or you're very old there's always work that the lord has for you to do so it, that that's i think that is also a message we can take away Definitely. So it shows that he he was dependent because he couldn't move so he would need help to get into the to the pool um when it was stirred um Based on his response to Jesus, he might have been a bit of a complainer because he's he's not looking at the fact that, you know, there might be people to help him. He's just saying that he needs somebody to help him to get into the pool. And based on his reaction to his healing event, which we will go into greater detail shortly, we can see that, you know, he seems to be shifting the buck and passing the, the buck along because, um, when he is asked to give an account of, of how um, certain things have happened to him, he is quick to pass it on to Jesus and not in a good way. And the fact that Jesus confronts him in the temple um, about his sinning means, and that's to be expected because we are human, that we are sinners. He too was a sinner. And the last couple of verses of the passage also shows that you know, um, the expected result of this miraculous event in his life and, uh, and in his behavior maybe um, has not borne fruits. He seems to be somewhat ungrateful and unrepentant um, given his actions of reporting Jesus to the Jews subsequently. Um, so hopefully this has given us a better idea of who the invalid was. Um, in, in terms of his, his main character traits. So Jesus comes along and sees him lying there and knowing his backstory, um, asks him a question. Do you want to be made well? Um, to me, it, it seems a rather strange question um, to be asked in somebody who has been sick for such a long time. Do you want to be made well? Um, what What do you think, um, Jesus? Why do you think Jesus asked that question, and what was he really asking? Do you have any thoughts? It, it seems a strange. Um, if I've been sick, I'm glad to be made well, whether by going to the doctor or getting healing. So, why did Jesus ask, "Do you want to be made well?" Any thoughts? Um, Nicole, um, I. My my um raise hand function isn't working, so I just have oh, to. Okay. Sure. This. But um, my thought is that Jesus was testing his faith, and um, you earlier asked about what 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 struck us, and I I was um brought back to Reverend Bogle's um message on Sunday. Mm -hmm. He where, stole my thunder. I'm sorry? He stole my thunder. Yes, about that, that, that little faith that can, you know, take us so far. I wanted to add that, add that comment when you, um, you know, when you asked what did we notice about that scene? For me, despite the length of time that, and he's, he's not getting... He's not making any progress on his many days and years and whatever. He still held out. Because for me, that was the mustard seed of faith that um, Reverend Bogle spoke, that spoke about on Sunday. Yes, definitely. Evine, you can go ahead. 
you're, you're not on easy though. Yes, yes. And back to your question about um, why did Jesus ask him that? You know, sometimes we wallow in self-pity and um, we don't really want to be healed because all of the sympathy that we would get and the donations and so on might dry up. Oh, yeah. And so we're living comfortably in our illness or in our sin, for that matter. And we really don't want to get out. So that's one side of it. But the other side is sometimes we don't want things enough. So Jesus could have been saying to him, do you really, really want healing? Are you trying hard enough for it? Because as you said early on, it comes by faith. And so if he didn't have the faith that um, he could be healed, then it would be a little bit more difficult for him to receive that healing. That's my two cents. It's worth more than two cents. Um, yes, Vivian, that, that those are good points. And and um, was it Carolyn before? Yes, very good points. Um, and I want to um, piggyback on, on, yes, Denise, can go ahead, Denise. I was um, thinking the very same thing that our sister just mentioned, that sometimes when people are in these positions, they are not just unwell physically, but mentally, emotionally, and psychologically. So after a while, you become so accustomed to being in any of those states that really one has to ask oneself, do you really want to get well? <laughs> and I think that is what Jesus was in fact asking. Have you made enough effort? What is your faith level like? How, you've been here for so many years. Um, you say that others come and jump before you or going before you. What efforts have you made? Where is your level of faith? Is that indicative of how well you want to become or do you want to become well at all or do you care to become well? I think that that was what Jesus was asking um, this gentleman and it is pertinent to a lot of people now because sometimes when persons are unwell, they tend to want to give up and they may want to give up prematurely too. And then you as someone who is mentoring or helping will have to say, well, has Jesus given up on you? Why do you want to give up on yourself? I've had to say that to somebody recently. And then you start to encourage a person that builds their faith and you see the turnaround, the divine or the turning point in that person's behavior. That is what I wanted to add. Thank you for giving me that opportunity. Thank you. Thanks, Denise. Right. Thanks. So Nikki, just one thing I wanted to, to oh, add. Oh, yes. Yes, Sharon. Yes. Faith. You know, I remember um, Reverend Google again. The difference is not so much the quantity, but the quality okay. of faith. And for me, it is when Jesus spoke about that mustard seed, it's it's who you put your faith in that's important. That, that, that small mustard seed of faith in Jesus you know, um, makes all the difference. And I think for all of us, that is what we, we really need to get to know Jesus so that the, 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 the faith that we have, if, when we place that in him, then miracles will happen. Definitely. So to summarize, based on what our sisters have said, um, so Jesus's question, which at the initial you know, get go might seem strange. Had had some purposes because, as has been mentioned, um, persons for various reasons um, in the in the ancient um, Middle East, there beggars used to make a good living um, on the sympathy of persons. So he could have been, you know, profiting from a, a reasonable lifestyle based on the kindness of strangers, and losing that might have been an inhibiting factor where he might not have wanted to be healed. That's why Jesus is acting. And sometimes persons are fearful because this is all that I have known and um, healing will bring a new change in my circumstance that I'm not ready for. So fear can in some instances make us fearful of wanting to be made well in the various ways we can interpret what well is. 
So being fearful um, or identity is caught up in our, our illness, we take that away, who am I, what am I, that sort of thing. So there are various reasons why um, Jesus would have wanted to find out, you know, where, where, where the invalid mindset headspace was at, does he really want to be made well? And as has been pointed out before, there were many there, but Jesus only healed one. What does that mean for the others who are there and weren't healed? Um, that must have been a negative thing because he, the Lord works in mysterious ways and therefore healing for this invalid is what he needed at this time. The others who were there might not, that might not have been what um, would be for their best um, benefit. So the Lord knows and the Lord had selected the invalid to perform this particular miracle. But another lesson that we can take away from this initial interaction of Jesus with the invalid is that he knows. Verse 6 says that Jesus already knew everything about the invalid. So Jesus knows our circumstance, who we are, what we what we're going through, and he is there willing and waiting to meet us wherever we are. So we can take comfort in that that and as these the passages that are highlighted especially um psalm 56 8 i don't know if anybody wants to read that somebody find that one and the luke 12 6 to 7 which we should probably know but we can probably read again for reinforcement so if i could get two readers for those two particular passages psalm 56 8 and luke 12 6 to 7 just for reinforcement before we move on Okay, Psalm 56, 8. Yes. Record my misery. List my tears on your scroll. Are they not in your record? All right, so God knows when we're crying, and, and some of us cry a lot. God knows our tears, and he is, he, he is he's recording them and keeping them and understanding what we are going through. So we're not crying in a, in a vacuum or you know, crying with nobody caring. He's always there to care. And then Luke, the Luke passage. He said, since you're already there, you could just finish up that Luke, Luke um, those two verses sure. of Luke. So Luke 12, 6 to 7. Okay. Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? Yet not one of them is forgotten by God. Indeed, the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. Right. So... Some of us think we are insignificant. Nobody's insignificant in the eyes of God. He, as um, C.S. Lewis once said, if we were the only person in the world, we would, we would be as important as we are now when we have 8 billion, 9 billion. Um, the Lord sees us, knows us, loves us. So Jesus having asked the invalid, do you want to be made well? The initial obvious response would have seemed to have been, Yes, Lord, I want to be made well. But what was the invalid's response? We find his response in verse 7. And his response is, Sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. And while I'm making my way, someone else steps down ahead of me. Not exactly a resounding yes. But what does it mean? Um, our sister earlier had said that it, it showed that he had faith since he was there all this time. And um, but what else can we say about his response? Do we do we have any thoughts before I give you my thoughts? <laughs> and we had covered some of this in when we were looking at his um, character as to who he was. Uh, Nicola, while we wait for responses, Sarita has okay. put a comment in the chat. In the chat, said, yes, sir. I found it interesting that he said, sir, he did not know who he was speaking to. Exactly. And we will see later on that um, when he's tackled by the, the Jews as to who um, has made him well, he said, the man who told me to you know, take up my thing and walk. He didn't know Jesus' name. 
But after the, the, the incident in the temple, he for sure knew Jesus' name and went back and told the Jews. So yes, yes, he didn't know who he was dealing with. He so, seemed also yeah. to, to just jump, um, to be on the defensive, like, um, yes. explain, yes. trying to, to show that, you know, it's not my fault kind of thing, like, I'm still yes. here, you know. Exactly, so he exactly. He's asking a question, he doesn't answer directly. He, he's right. giving reasons, you know. So don't bother thinking right. I don't want to get well, but, you know, these are the reasons. And to, and, and to go back, to go back to Reverend Bogle again, you have to activate your faith. Have to activate your faith, yeah. definitely. Right. So, so the invalid does have a measure of faith because he's coming to the pool in expectation that if he gets the opportunity to get into the water when it is being stirred, he will be healed. But his faith has conditions. Yes, Jean, you can go ahead. Yes, although, yes, I agree that he's, you know, making excuses. But at the same time, it says, while I am trying to get in. So the fact that he was trying to get in shows that he did have a measure of faith. Yes, definitely. Totally agree there. He did have a measure of faith. It might have been a bit conditional, a bit limited, but... As 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 Reverend Bogle has said, you know, the faith of a mustard seed. Who we have the faith in, as Sister Sharon has said, is is the critical deciding point. So, the invalid's response we could compare to other persons in the Bible, and uh, I have three persons who, who we could look at here. We we all know this the story of Naaman, and Naaman's response to me was somewhat similar to um, the invalid because it was, it was a bit conditional or it was you know, defined by his expectations as to how things healing in this instance was supposed to happen. So he was told to wash himself in the River Jordan. I'm a big army man and I don't think I should be doing that. Why is that necessary? You know, you can just you know, heal me otherwise. So he had faced limitations on how healing should happen. But then we have the woman with the issue of blood, which I hear we were doing a little bit later in our series. Um, her response and the, 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 the response of the person, the blind man, were, were two different responses to the invalid and Naaman. Because the, 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 the woman with the, the issue of blood placed no limits on the power of God to, to, to meet her needs and, and address her situation. So... You know, she's battling through that crowd and, and, and going to touch the hem of his garment to get her healing. It's, it's a little thing, um, not a, you know, expected thing. Um, you know, that seems to be an insignificant event, touching somebody's garment, but her healing flowed through that. And it's because, you know, she placed no limits on what could happen for her if she believed. And the healing of the blind man is, is raised here because it will help us further on when we once again consider the, the whole issue of whether sin is a cause for sickness or illnesses. But the healing of the blind man is also instructive because if we look at verse 38 of John 9, if I could get a reader for verse 38 of John 9, we see that his response to his healing interaction with Jesus was totally different. And therefore, he had a comprehensive, complete, wholesale change because of his interaction with Jesus. He had the right response. And because he had the right response, he experienced for 100%, as they would say, um, healing. So if we could get a reader for verse 38 of chapter 9, before we move on. I believe, Lord, yes. the man said, and knelt down before Jesus. Right. So his response is, I believe. And, and as a consequence, he, he got full um, healing. So we have looked at the invalid's response. What was Jesus' response to his, um, to, the, to the invalid? So Jesus 
unlike other um, situations where healing occurred, didn't pray this time around. He, he gave a command to the, the invalid, get up, walk. You know, and this, 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 this command we see in other places in the gospel, um, Jairus' daughter, awaken, get up, rise, get up. It's it's a it's a giving us a sense of movement from a fixed position and even beyond the physical um, interpretation, may perhaps giving us a sense of progress, growth, development in um, somebody's faith. So um, these references are here for persons. I mean, we, we can if persons are interested, they can get the PowerPoint after, so you can um, look at um, similar situations where Jesus had issued this particular command, get up, arise, awaken. So we have Jairus' daughter, the paralytic who was lowered through the ceiling, and the man with the shriveled hand. Yes, Albert, go ahead. Thanks, Nicola. It, you know, th this reminds me of um, Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, where, you know, Jesus is speaking of inviting us to come when we're heavy laden. So you think that if you're heavy laden, the last thing you want to do is move, is move further. But Jesus says, come. You know, it, it's sort of the context of activating that, that Jesus wants some action to in, engage us yes. in the faith journey, the faith walk. We talk about the faith walk, you know? So I see it in a similar context, Nicola. Thanks. Definitely. Thanks so much, Albert. So. Let us take a little deeper look at Jesus' response. He told the invalid three things. Stand up, take your mat, and walk. So in standing up, Jesus is saying, I I'm coming to your life. Things are going to change. <laughs> the invalid business is not going to work. So get up off the ground and start living the life that... Um, coming into a relationship with me would mean take up your bed. So the bed was a symbol of his dependency, his misery, you know, that lying on the So take up your bed. Um, don't lie on it. You know, we're not going back to, the, to, to where we were before. We have a new life in Jesus. All right, so we're not lying on, on, on our mats anymore. We have things to do. The Lord has given us work to do and walk. Um, you, you, you need to stand on your own two feet now. Um, you were dependent before. Um, you have a new life, which I'm going to help you with, of course. And, um, you know, so don't expect to be carried around anymore. Um, any thoughts as, as, as Reverend Bogle, and we, are, we, are, we keep coming back to Reverend Bogle because his, his sermon on Sunday was so, um, you know, syncs nicely with, with this particular study. As has been noted before, you know, in that illustration of that, of that gentleman who came to his church and he had been told to, to heal him and he had thrown away his sticks, but the very next day he came back on the crutches. You know, so the Lord does his work in our lives, but we also have a role to play. If Lazarus had stayed in the tomb when the Lord told him, Lazarus, come forth, where would he have been? So there's always, a, a God makes us co-workers with him in the, the work of, of, of his ministry. So we have to do, as um, members of, of the Bible study have noted, we have to do our part and activate, quote unquote, activate our faith. I like that, that term. So the man has been healed and he's gone about his business. We would have thought that, you know, this would be the end of the story. Um, everybody would have been happy. But our, our passage shows that we have some Sabbath police who are not so happy um, with the the, the, the result of this particular healing story. Um, they have noticed that the man is walking with his mat on a Sabbath. And um, Jeremiah 17, 21, 22 noted that carrying quote unquote loads for your work was prohibited on a Sabbath. My question is, is what the man, the invalid was doing, could be considered work. Um, 
is, is another thing. But what was wrong with the Sabbath police um, reaction to the healing event? And why do you think they had this particular reaction? Any thoughts? Um, Nikki, we, we yes, know that. Were. Yeah, we know that. Um, we know that that these men were troubled about Jesus, so they were looking. They were looking for some reason, I think, to create some some problem. But they asked the man first, and the man didn't even know Jesus' name. Name. Yeah. So they said to themselves, "Well, we didn't get to again." So this time now the man came back and said, yes, it is Jesus. It's like they were related. They wanted to stir up trouble with, with, with Jesus because we know they were after him. Right, right, right. So 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 sometimes um not only for the invalid, but for persons who are around and and and, and looking on. We also have our expectations as to what should happen and when it should happen and um, to whom it should happen. And, and so sometimes we are so focused on the, the, the small stuff that we miss the big picture. So the, the Sabbath police were taken up with the law, the commandments, and even this commandment, this, this, this prohibition that is here, the, 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 the law that they got from God didn't actually have things about, you know, prohibitions against loads man has added on um based on you know they're 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 trying to interpret and 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 help other persons to, to comply with what the lord wants so sometimes we add additional burdens in trying to help um you know spread the gospel we add additional burdens and add additional um things to what the lord has as as said we are to do that weren't in the initial um scriptures um, so that is something that we need to be, be careful about and, and be guided by the Spirit as to what it is the Lord is really saying in a particular passage. So the, the, over time, the Jews had added on various, um, in trying to explain the various commandments and, and, and laws that God had provided to them, they added on um, extra things that weren't in the initial. And now these have become a, a barrier to people. And then their focus is so much on this that they have lost the, the plot. Yes, Jean, you can go ahead. Another thing, too, is that sometimes it's our focus on tradition. You know, that's the way we have always done it. And so, for example, in the 60s, in the heyday of the charismatic movement, there, there were um, elements in the Anglican Church that were totally opposed to it. Yes, so that were opposed to it and lost many committed Christians from the church as a result. Very good point, Jean. You really get caught up in the tradition. And Anglicans, because we have a very structured um, church, um, that can be a danger that we, we, we fall prey to. So in, in, in helping to combat that, we need to understand that understanding spiritual matters, we can't just do it with our natural minds. No matter how, how well developed or, or, or educated our natural minds are, we still need the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And that is what the first Corinthians passage quoted here, 214 is, is, is saying that to understand spiritual matters, we need the Spirit's guidance. And we have instances listed here, Zachariah, Nicodemus, Simon the Sorcerer, of persons who did not understand what was happening because they were using their, their natural mind. Nicodemus didn't understand what being born again was. He thought it would have been you know, jumping back into his mother's womb as, as, at his old age there. Um, so some of what the Lord tells us through his word, through his preacher, requires us to to be led by the spirit as as homer has pointed out the healed man's um action was to you know pass the buck blame jesus um as a consequence but so as as gene has noted you know we we need to remember that rules exist yes and they serve a purpose um but we must not get so caught up 
in following our rules, the rules that the Lord has laid out, um, and then miss the big picture. Um, we need to be aware that, um, you know, the Lord does things in a new way and be open to, to that so that we can see where God is working. Uh, and Nicola, consistent with that point, Alicia had written in the chat, very good point about being so taken up with the small stuff. We miss the big stuff. Yeah. Yes. All right. So a little later on in, 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 in our story, we find that Jesus has found the healed man in the temple. And we notice that it's Jesus who has found him. We would have expected Jesus to be going around with a crowd of persons who want to hear his, his message, who want to be healed, who want to interact with him. But despite the crowd, Jesus has found the invalid, the healed invalid in the temple. And he confronts him with um, his, 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 his life um, by saying, stop sinning. And the verb that is used here is in the present imperative. So it suggests that the man has been sinning and, and continues to sin even after being healed. And, and the sin is not a one-off, once-in-a-lifetime event, but something that is part of his nature. And, and the whole issue of the woman caught in adultery, the Lord had said something similar to her at that time. Um, you know, who is here to, 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 to um, cast blame? Nobody. And he says, neither do I, but go and sin no more. So it, it is something that affects both male and female. It's, it's a part of the human condition. But what the Lord is saying, you know, stop sinning. But otherwise, something worse will happen to you. Does this worse that he's making reference to um, indicate sickness or is it something else? What is Jesus saying? Let something worse happen to you in verse 14. Yes, Beverly. I think he's talking about death. Eternal death. Because the man was, was sick. He was sick. So something worse to happen to him would be everlasting death, I think. Right. I, I, I think so too. I agree. Right. So, so he might have gotten sick too. That might be an outcome of the sinful nature. But the, the, the critical point is the, 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 the eternal death. That is what Jesus is referring to. That is a something worse. We think sickness as being the, the end, the, the absolute ultimate worst thing that can happen to some of us, but the eternal damnation is a thousand times or 10,000 times worse. So when Jesus meets this man in the temple, he's saying, stop, I have healed you. I have I've created the, 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 the scope, the, the, the way for you to make a change in your life. It requires repentance and acceptance of the grace um, for you to move forward. But that is what, you know, you're required to do. So it's, it's the, the man had been outwardly healed. The, the inward healing needed to take place as well for him to be completely made whole. So what was the invalid's response? His response was to... Um, double up on the, the initial betrayal and, and then go back. Because in the previous interaction with the Jews, he was accosted by the Jews. He was going about his business and they saw him and they said, what are you doing carrying that? But this time around, after meeting with Jesus in the temple, he went and sought out the Jews. to and He knows Jesus' name this time around and he tells them, well, you know, this is a guy that you need to deal with and, and sort out. So his reaction again is, is like and unlike other instances in the, in the Bible. And um, two instances are here. One is alike, um, the healing of the 10 lepers, or specifically the nine ungrateful um, lepers who, yes, they had been healed, but they, they, weren't, they weren't grateful. One returned to thank the Lord for his, 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 his um, miracle. So those nine lepers were very much like the invalid, ungrateful, and indicative of, of a lack of repentance 
But then we have other examples in the New Testament where you know there's a different response. So we have the Samaritan woman, right? She does also go and tell, but her telling is a different thing. Her telling is so come and see. Come and see, which is a different from the writing out that goes on with the invalid. So her come and see is come and share. You know, I'm not I'm I, I found like the lady who's looking for her lost coin. I found my treasure and I want you to have a similar experience. So come and see. And then the, the nobleman um, in the John 4 also had a similar reaction. So our story has shown us that um, people have not changed um, since that time. And we are, we are all still struggling with our our, our faith and, and developing our faith and, and that, that Christian walk, that, that journey that we are all taking. But we have this story, this miracle here um, that has provided some lessons that we have learned. And, and some of those questions that we had asked at the beginning, um, why do we think this particular um, miracle was included? Hopefully by this time, we have a better idea in our minds as for us why we think this particular story was included and some of the main themes you know some of the messages that for us um, that resonate with us um, we would have learned some of that and we would have come around to, to, to some better understanding of the interplay between sin and sickness so to summarize our lessons um, which I've called lessons for disciples. Um, and there are other lessons. Uh, these are just some um, we can we can add on um, in our in our private um, devotional time. We are the invalid. The the the, the, the story is, is talking to us because we are sick in various ways. It might be physical, it might be emotional, it might be mental. So we have um, physical disorders or disorder sicknesses that like the invalid, require the need of the great physician. So we are the invalid. God's grace, he works miracles, but those miracles are in, a, in accordance with his will for us, and his will for us is always the best. So he works miracles without necessarily deserving it um, or earning it. Um, and and some people can fall into you know the works um, salvation um, story. So we need to remember that God's grace works the miracles that we need, and what we need, the miracle we need, might not be the miracle we think we need. But the Lord knows what we need. So the crowd is at the the, the, the temple, but only one is healed physically because that is what he needed. The rest required other things which the Lord would provide. The outward blessing that the, the invalid received can exist at the same time with, you know, an inner death because he's healed physically, but as we see, he, he lacks a, a, a repentance and he's ungrateful and, and spiteful to some extent. So therefore, yes, we can be blessed outwardly, but there's also the need for us to look inwardly as well. Verse 6, where Jesus asks the question, do you really want to be healed, can instruct us sometimes when people ask us to pray for them. You know, we, we can ask questions in a tactful way, a spirit-led way, um, so that we can discern what it is that their true um, need is, and that is what we need to pray to the Lord for. Um, so um, we need to be discerning and, and ask questions. Sometimes we must be led by the spirit. Then we need a God awareness and a right mindset, a right, a right mind, mind frame. You know, so we're not, we're not obsessed with our rules. Rules are good, like in school, but um, to a point. And we need to, to be led by the spirit as to where that point stops and, and where the spirit needs to lead us on from there so that we don't miss our, our particular miracle. Um, and then the final lesson that I had here, but there are many more, is that 
having been healed in whatever way the healing is. Jesus expects, as the circumstances dictate, repentance and or transformation. So it's not just healing and done. There is a, a continuing story that goes on until we meet up again with the Lord um, at a point to be, a time to be determined. So the, the healing that we get, the, the, our interaction with our, our Lord is for a purpose. And, and we need to fulfill that purpose as we go about our daily lives. It's not easy. As, as my final thought here, before I take any additional comments, is that our, our, our circumstances and everybody's circumstances is going to be different, impact us in various ways. And, and the Lord is going to be working with us in our particular circumstances. He might not take us out of the circumstance, but he will give us the strength to, to go on in those circumstances. So the man, Jesus helped the man in a way that he didn't necessarily expect, um, but it worked for, for, the, for the man. And the Lord is telling him, you know, take up your mat and go, and he's going with him to, uh, you know, deal, help him deal with um, life as, as it progresses. So. We don't always get um, the happy ending that we, 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 we sometimes expect, but we get an ending that is for our best benefit and, and effort. So what, what are our thoughts? We're winding down. Any final theme? Yes, theme. Yeah. Um... Lots of good insights that you have brought to it. One of the things I particularly like um, was the comparison between uh, this man and the woman with the issue of blood because they both had obstacles to their healing. And, you know, yes, they, they handled those obstacles differently. I like that. I must say that I had not thought before, before this study, I had not thought negatively of his um, telling the, the people, the, the leaders, that it was Jesus. So I thought about it and, and I looked to see what some, somebody else said. And they were saying that it showed how intimidated he was <laughs> by, by the leadership. <laughs> I was in a sense thinking that he was testifying. So I thank you for opening that, that up. <laughs> Okay, G. Any other thoughts? Yes, Beverly. I, I think I, um, it was Jean who spoke just now. Yes. And um, I, I was thinking that the comparison between this man, I, I hadn't thought about it either, that he was ungrateful necessarily and was ratting out Jesus. But when you think about the way that the blind man reacted when the Pharisees approached him and he he was so uh, I mean when he knew it was Jesus the way he spoke he was so sure and so so unintimidated by them and he asked them you want to be his disciple too you know it showed that, that, that there is where the difference comes up for me and um, the point that you made really highlighted that that this man really was ratting out. He didn't have to go back to the Jews. He didn't have to go back to them. No, he didn't have to. Yeah. So, so the, the, it's good. You, you opened a new, new thought here for me. Okay, thanks, Beverly. James, your turn. Um, yeah, yeah, uh, yes, Nicola. Um, you, you give us a new perspective on this. Because... All along, I knew about this um, passage and the way I learned it. I believe the, the person with disability, who we call an invalid, was really celebrating after he was healed. That's why I saw him. He was in a celebratory mood, moving up and down, have his mat and still can't put on his mat, telling everybody, hallelujah, Jesus has healed me. That's how I saw it. But in fact, he came with a different perspective whereby he was passing off the blame to, to, to Jesus. 
Uh, but there is something that of interest, and I think uh, it is very interesting to me, is that after he was ill, right, Jesus saw him again, <laughs> again, and I said, in our life, this is how it is. We have been saved, we have been ill, and we're still going around with the baggage is still. So Jesus have to come back now and say to us, please, remember, you still have the baggage, you know. You still have that baggage with you, know. You need to release it, man. Okay. Release it. If you do not release it, the consequence will be so and so. And I think this is very, I would say this part of the passage is one which is very instructive. You know what I mean? Something whereby as children of God, we need to understand. After we heal, sometimes we still like our own baggages. And we need baggages. to just throw them away. Show them away. Yes. And Jesus likes to remind us, please, you have some baggages. Show them away. Get rid of them. You're a new person. You're a new creature. Yes. That's my question. Yes. Mm. Thanks. Thanks, James. And we will close off this section with Michelle. Go ahead, Michelle. I, actually, I am sorry to disappoint. It, it, it's not really Michelle, but I, I had a really, I thought it was really good, Nikki. But the other thing is I had a perspective and the perspective really is that healing starts when we recognize that there is the need to be healed. I'll tell you why. What happens is that I remember once we used to encounter a gentleman um, by Washington Boulevard and Malines, who was always begging. He had a deformity in his leg. And, you know, we were trying to get him to see an orthopedic surgeon to get something done definitively for his leg. And, and he refused. He never, ever kept an appointment. And one of the things that comes home to me is that healing begins when we first recognize the need to be healed, you know? Yeah, and, and, sick and, Yes, and, and it happens across the board. So we may be in relationships that do need to be, do need healing with maybe in a variety of situations that do need to be healed. And we do need to recognize firstly what's happening. Last thing is that just today, a friend who I believe is also part of this Bible study was speaking with me and I outlined a certain situation I was in and how I was stewing about it. And she, was, she pointed out you know, in not as gentle a way as I think the Lord would have, but she pointed out that, look, you can stay where you are and stew or you can decide you can do something about it. About it. And, and it really struck me that healing starts when, when we recognize there's that need. Okay? Yes. Thank you, Dr. John. So I'll close with the question that Jesus asked that man is one that he would also ask of us. Do you want to be made well? And we need to remember his command to the invalid and to us. Stand up, take your mat, and walk. I'd like us to close in prayer before we I hand over to the, the, the operators. So, Father, we, your people, are sometimes spiritually dull, um, yet we continue to receive your bountiful blessings to us. And sometimes we respond so ungratefully. It's not just the healed man in the story that requires healing, but it is us. Forgive us, change our hearts, put in us faith and gratitude, we pray. And we thank you for your grace that covers all our sins. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I hand over to the operator. Amen, amen. Thank you so much, Sister Nicola, for such a thorough and thought-provoking study. Um, and very simply presented, which I really value, and I'm sure others do too. I just want to close this segment with the last three comments that were in the chat. Um, the delay in his healing, and this is from Sarita, the delay in his healing was actually for his healing. 
Sometimes we are praying for something and we do not get the answer immediately. But if we remain steadfast in faith, then the answer will come. And then Carolyn said, you have given me a new insight of the healed sinner. You have a very controlled, soothing tone. Peace and grace be with you. I agree, Carolyn. She was wonderful. And then Sonia said, excellent point, John. If we don't see and accept that we need to be healed, it cannot occur. And Beverly said, thank you for a very informative session, Nicola and team. And Sandra ended with amen. And I also end with amen. It was wonderful. Thank you, Nicola. All right, so we're going to now go into the closing song. And after this, Nicola, I'm going to ask you if you can, well, closing song, closing remarks, and then do the benediction for us. Thanks again. As usual, you're welcome to sing along. This song will be What a Healing Jesus. Please feel free to sing along with Mike's Muted and let the words minister to you. Walking by the sea.
Thank you very much, Alicia, for that piece. All right, we normally like to finish promptly at eight. I'm just gonna ask you for two minutes extra just to okay. remind us of a couple of things. First of all, I'd like to thank everyone who contributed to this evening's study, whether in the form of technical support or in praying or presenter and all of the participants. Um, thank you so much. You made it such a fulfilling study today. And for those of us who may wish to experience the study again, or for those who, who missed it, the recording will soon be uploaded to the YouTube channel of the Church of the Transfiguration. Now, next week, the focus of our study will be the miracle healing of the paralytic, and that will be led by Sister Heather Lynn. This will be followed by healing of the blind man to be led by Reverend Omar Morrison, and then healing of the woman with the issue of blood, which will be led by Sister Fiona Simpson. And then healing of the crippled woman will round out the current sub-theme. Um, we'll share more on the topics under the final sub-theme as the series progresses. And we look forward to seeing you all next week. And for the remainder of the series, please invite a friend. Remember that the platform can accommodate up to 500 persons, so there is no constraint there. Um, thanks again for joining and take care until we see each other again next week. Thank you. Nicola? The benediction. The benediction. Yes. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen. 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 All right. Thank you, everybody. Have a good rest of the evening. Take care.